And you really need to explore, especially for a refugee population, about how to get engagement and sex education. Our New Zealand system obviously is not working for this population. So. Um, I think in Hamilton what we're doing is getting the female community leader who is the first female community leader in a very conservative population. Um, we've linked her in with family planning and they're sort of doing what we did in Auckland around providing parent education that's separate to young people's education. And with young people, we just have movie nights and get them to discuss issues that are going on for them and then make the talks based on that. I think it needs any change that's going to be made needs to be made by the community mm. and sometimes it's just a matter of the community isn't just ready to talk about these issues. Um, but in Auckland we've got, at the moment we're working with Safari Playgroup which is a ethnic based playgroup uh, which runs three days in three of the regions and with that we go in and we do a 45 minute to an hour long um, sexual health topic with different sexual health providers um, and it gives the space, the women the space to talk about what's going on for them but also to hear real information um, that is culturally appropriate because um, our cultural advisors will screen sort of mm. the tools that are being used, what's appropriate for the different community groups that we're working with and because this is a diverse group so we've got women from the Middle East, Africa, um, we've got some Asian population um, and they're at different stages of migration, so we try to keep it as general as possible and not to overload them with information, but just mm. to provide the different sexual health services that are out there, because often with sexual health services, they're just not visible. Um, and a lot of cultures where the medical profession is just seen as doctors and nurses and nothing else, um, it's really important for people to get the wide scope of what the different services are. Mm. And I think that's, that's the only real way that you can create sustainable change. Um, but also to create behaviour change, it just takes time. I have to say, there's a, um, a week at the World Health Organisation fitted in with what you did with that, that group. The, the biggest change to how health messages are taken up was to have a village meeting. And you just had, it wasn't even a doctor or nurse, it was a, was that even a health worker? They just had, had just there to guide the conversation a wee bit, but it was a conversation among the whole village. And that was <laughs> so all of the education that we put in, uh, forget about that, do what you were doing with the, <laughs> with the group. Yeah, and you find people that are influencers in those groups, whether, um, so for our Hamilton group, it's this uh, female community leader, she's doing parental um, courses. Um, how to parent in a New Zealand context mm -hmm. and we just embedded the health messaging in the different workshops. Mm -hmm. At the moment I am designing a parenting workshop for parenting in the digital era for um, mostly refugee populations but hopefully we'll be able to mm. work with other ethnic groups too. I, I'm, I'm just all, I'm aware that Dineen was relatively new to working with um, former refugees and I only briefly started working with that group myself. There's been a big focus on children and women, but the emphasis on men um, has been, is, is, I guess we're becoming more and more aware of men, um, you know, the adjustment to their status, their roles have dramatically changed, not working at home a lot of the time. What's been your experience of working with males who are former refugees and helping them with that? process of adjustment? It's been quite limited. Um, I know that there is, there is an extreme focus on women and children because often that's what we see. Um, but with the male populations in Auckland, uh, Refugees as Survivors has a male's um, mm. get together, like how we do the women's get together and they have um, male health professionals that come in and do exactly what we're doing around dialoguing and it's just about providing a safe space for them to talk about their issues. I know with the males it's a completely different world because as you say they've lost their status, the roles of um, what a man is in their current society has completely changed. Um, so with that group they provide um, counselling, they talk about different issues and they sort of give 
once a week a space for men to get together. Um, I don't know if that's being done in other regions and I know in Auckland that's the only male group that's running for out of all the ethnicities that we've got, it's only one male Afghani group that is that exists. So just in general, um, it's quite limited the work we do with, with men. Can I, can I add to that? that cause not, not, and it's not just men, because some women don't want to just sit around talking about feelings, but um, some, some men find it that they get more from being with other men doing stuff. So that's right. It's so about actually yeah. having something like you know fishing, you know, casting your rod and chatting to the guy beside you, and in that conversation, lots of things will come yes. out. Yeah. So sometimes it's like um, I remember attending a, a session that Ayan did for refugee youth and hearing about how some of the, the, the refugee young people, the females were managing to maintain their cultural identity and succeed academically and the boys were getting lost. And so what they found was by having um, men in the community gather them together to have soccer training and soccer practice, whatever it is, but it's, it's providing a space to, for them and tools so they can do what they want to do for fun regularly and be together. Create cultural connection. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So, you know, whatever they're into. Yeah, that's right. I'm just make a general comment to your question, comment about groups. It's sort of interesting that we don't use groups more often in healthcare. I mean, the stuff yeah. around diabetes is mm. much better control yeah. to do it in groups. And you just much don't use fun. the word group, that's the thing. <laughs> <laughs> oh, the real trouble we've had in our clinic groups is just the air traffic control of getting people there and getting them to come back and having time off during the day versus doing evening stuff, you know, all those sort of um, logistical sort of issues. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> Any other wonderful things you're doing in your clinics or questions or comments? Oh. Oh, it's just a note that I made for myself earlier. I think, Bruce, you had said, what were people doing 50 years ago? I think that's when six o'clock closing. That's how people were coping 50 years ago. Was getting, was getting absolutely smashed oh. and, then, and then going home and hitting people. Um, but then I oh, just... Um, the word, the pronouns the, you know there's they the, and, and Māori it's ear and I thought oh why we should just practice it's I A everybody ear yeah. ear yeah. and then you, yeah ear it sounds like this but and so the, it's a Polynesian word and then because I found French really hard because it's like what masculine feminine objects oh my god we just call everything ear yeah. <laughs> and you know and so yeah ear and then they and the will just it can feel clumsy in english using the word they can't they you know they um uh, well yeah i mean the person needs to say that that's what they prefer um but people get that they, they sometimes preferred name for transgender people mm. as they so um, it does get much easier with you yeah. it does yeah a few months and then you stop right? yeah <laughs> And that's all. Oh, and I think there was that thing about the broken leg. And I think where somebody said something, oh, you're transgender or something, and the patient had a broken leg. And I think I was like, oh, hang on. So the information we're trying to elicit is his, this, this person's at risk of DVT, they're going in a cast. And that's why, and that was where it requires us to take a step back and go, oh, there's a question I need to ask because of increased risk of blood clot in your, you know? And it's just trying to slow ourselves down rather than blurt something out just because we saw the NHI gender change. So I guess if you were sorry, you'd be asking, what medication are you taking? Yeah. Uh, what prescription medication are you yes. taking? Would, would be, I guess we'd get you around that. You yeah. Have to have to raise the issues. Yeah. Yeah. <coughs> I've got a gym coming out actually about mm -hmm. short-term steroids increases the risk of DVT fractures and sepsis. Thanks. Mm -hmm. <laughs>
<laughs> Not reading that. Right. But actually, I, I broke my ankle. I was on 40 milligrams of prednisone from my GP, and I was on the slopes in Aldina, and my ankle went north, south, east, west, painlessly, and I had to have But in fact, I tell people on actually high doses of steroids not to go jogging um, now because of the risk. It's about 800 people have to treat the break to get one break, but um, it's, a, it's a statistically significant increase. So that's coming out of the general next wow. couple of months. So, um, does that increase the females on the combined pill? Does that risk increase again if you're on the combined contraceptive pill? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know if anyone's thought of that. That would be quite interesting. Do you have it? Yeah. It would be quite interesting. So the um, shuttle's coming at 4.15, so we've got another 15 minutes if people have questions and things to ask. Comments to make for the moment? Is anybody got a case? Well, I'm going to pick it just very briefly touched on the Dakinian practice more friendly. I don't think our practice is friendly enough. I really don't. And it is difficult, you have to admit, because we do have four GPs, one of which is extremely conservative. So you don't really want people to come in and then go, oh, not them, don't go with them. You know, so it is hard. I'm just wondering, other than posters, which we have a few, and like I've got some appropriate ones on my door, and she has a so that's fine. But what else could we do so to make it more, like just youth-friendly, I think, more than Yeah, well, that's right. And I think, you know how we made clinics breastfeeding friendly? So it's trying to put that lens on and walk around the practice going, oh, would this... It's probably an idea. Yeah, exactly. So yeah. you need to just my son. I'm just going to walk him through and go, yeah. how would this feel? Yeah. And yeah. just, like, gosh, the bathrooms. Mm. You know, that's just the toilet. Does it have to have a branding on the outside? Because modern nightclubs, they're just toilets. You just go in, go out, wash your hands. That's it. It's not got a big label on the outside as to... Yeah, it's got no pictures of a skirt and trousers. It's just a toilet. <laughs> I'm going to go back and start putting condoms on our toilet. It'd be interesting to see the rate at which they, uh, rate at which they disappear. Uh, we, used to, we used to put violent statements in the, uh, behind the door. That was one little thing. If you put what? <coughs> Quite a little pamphlets on violence. So the patient's going to use the... Um, that really sounded bad for a while. Uh, <laughs> you know, if you're experiencing <laughs> violence. But um, no, what we're planning to do is, is put into our mission statement. And I guess what, do you, do you have a website for your practice? I mean, you could say some so is interested in transgender issues and children or something. Yeah. So there'd be ways if you've got a conservative partner, then you could discriminate um, that way. So that, because a lot of people do have a lot of website before they come in. Mm -hmm. Although you kind of want the word of mouth then to feel comfortable when they come, because so they might yeah. feel comfortable with me, but I'd like them to feel comfortable with the room, if you yes. know what I mean. And the reception. Yeah. And the reception, particularly. I don't think we give enough education to yeah, our I think it's about education mm -hmm. myself. I think last year we had this great big um, combined meeting with all the um, members of the World South community and we employed two cultural navigators, both of whom are former refugees, one from Iraq and one from Syria. And during the intermission between the speeches that were being given and a whole lot of music videos that were being shown, and at one point there was a really violent video of uh, something, a fight that was happening in the Middle East with people with guns. And so someone just asked the person where the music videos are on to just turn them off because it just wasn't appropriate. And the response was, don't be so PC. So it's just, you know, that kind of response gives you an indication of the, some of the attitudes that exist, you know. Mm -hmm. And when we changed the toilets to women only for some of the um, Arab women, it was like, why are you doing that for them when we don't do that for everybody else? So yeah. it's just about having basic conversations yeah. with everybody. Yeah. Um, other things too is that get somebody to look at all of your, you know, your clinic paperwork. Because it's so easy that you get so used to seeing, oh, this is the paper for that, this is the paper for that. But actually, there might be pronouns in there that kind of make people feel excluded, that it's only just about heterosexual relationships, only married or single, and you know, that kind of stuff. I discovered that when I was looking at the podcast where our, our keynote this year was David Cool and his experiences of men with prostate cancer. Of course, in the future, we're going to have uh, trans women with prostate cancer. And I suddenly was just going through this thing before, before we did the transgender webinar and realised how often and we actually were specifying gender when it's probably going to become um, less relevant. Mm. But the, the comment there about receptionists is interesting. My daughter did her thesis on receptionists as the invisible clinicians. Because um, if you ask them, they'll say they don't do clinical work. 
but you know, they're, they're filtering, are you sick today, are you blum, 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 um, and they're, they're having to make clinical decisions all the time, so, and they are the front, they are the front, I mean, we've had people leave our clinic because they didn't like receptionists, I mean, that, that, that's happened, because their relationship is often with the receptionist, and, and if the receptionist leaves, sometimes patients will leave, you know, it's, it's a very, um, it's a much under, under appreciated position, I think, and it's the hardest job in the clinic by a long way. Call that phone trauma in the morning. And, you know. and this gets a bit polarising too, because I've heard people complain about it. But I really liked being in a practice the other day where they asked people to not all stand at the counter at the same time, so that you waited, so only one person was at the counter, so they could actually have a conversation with the receptionist without everybody else hearing. But then other people say, "Oh, it's just a big, big," and you know, so. <laughs> You're not going to please all the people all the time. Um, I guess for me, my take home messages would be um, different people are at different settlement stages. So treating everyone as an individual, not, you know, you're a refugee and you've got all this baggage, so let me try to fix you, but rather really engaging with that person for what they've come to see you for. Um, using interpreters where possible, um, that's the most important thing, um, I think, for yeah, any clinician is to, um, everyone has the right to be heard and understood um, and for them to understand what you're trying to get across. So those are my two key messages. Mm. I think mine will be, um, I mean, it's good because this discussion too is honed it in. It's the education of the whole team. Because then when the whole team has challenged the, and reflected on their attitudes and their value system, what they bring, to our service, then they'll be ready for accepting people for who they are. Then there's the acknowledging people for the stage of acceptance they're at, um, trying to support them when they're ready to the next stage and trying to bring the family on board, somebody. And you know, again, family is identified by the individual as who their family is. Um, but for people who are you know, living with family, it's just, their their life expectancy and their health outcomes, I mean economic outcomes are going to be so much better if there's at least one person got their back. Who doesn't even need to doesn't have to even understand all of it, just needs to keep being there for them. Hmm. Yeah. So are there any things that people are like, what I'm going to do differently when I go home is put condoms in the, in the bathroom <laughs> and do the transgender audit. <coughs> what are other people going to do? They're bone bruised. Would be all right. So, um, I've got a grandson now. Not, I would like some more. So maybe I won't fit them in our toilet. So, anybody else got some things they're going to change when they go home from a result from today? I've got a lot to read. A lot of sites to look up, so I think that's probably what I'm going to do. And remember, the slides will be coming. Yeah, but I think lots of resources to look up and check out. Thank you. I'm going to try to summarise this from my peer group meeting to each side, to pass on the learning. So, some peer groups do do our do our webinars as a peer review group. Some people watch them live because if you only watch them live, you can ask questions. If you watch a recorded one, you can't. Or a podcast. So it's quite an innovative way. If, you, if you're short of a topic, um, then just you know just sit back and um, relax. So um, so that might be. Um, I've just invited Anne to come to the symposium next year, so we'll get her filmed so she can talk about FMG. So. Uh, um. Yeah, that's what that's what I'm going to be doing differently is a lot of what Ayan's been teaching us today. I made so many notes and I've got peer group coming up soon as well, but it's like I'll let them know, give them a taster, and then we'll do a webinar online thing, whatever you're calling it. <laughs> Because you mentioned interpreters, the University of Otago Dunedin has just uh, produced an online training mm. on working with interpreters in health. Mm. You haven't seen it yet, it's pretty good, one hour and they're working on accreditation. There's also the cold ones, mm -hmm. the culturally linguistically diverse communities um, courses they have one with working with interpreters, refugees, migrants, mental health. Uh, there's a maternal health year, um, and then they've got the face-to-face -face option and the online option as cool. well. So.
So the other changes going home? Looking, just looking at the paperwork the enrollment form is on the Yeah, yeah, so I rather have to change out. Yeah. yeah. The Minister of Health. Oh. Is anybody here from the Minister of Health? I've heard that there's some work in developing a standard for seats and juniors. Because we were looking at our pension management system to to have seats in gender. Um, that's the collection, and we just see that that's happening. So that might be of interest to all of us across the health system. Because yeah. we need something that talks to the NES, talks to NHI, because from primary to secondary, that's because in the UK apparently you have to go to London to get a patch smear if you are a trans man. You, the system won't allow you to put, oh. you know, yeah. <laughs> if you change the gender at that level, so you have to go to a special clinic in London. My conversations with the Ministry of Health has been that they are promising <laughs> there's the software, the PIM software vendors are trying to do the changes that we need for our work so that we can have all the information on the dashboard so we get the right pronouns and have the right cancer screening stick every time you submit the information. So, it's coming. I know on our forms now, so we've just changed them. It actually says sex assigned at birth, but it's also got um, um, gender identity as well. So, you can actually have both. Um, you can create local codes though until until the software is better you can create local codes for whatever it is you're trying to keep um, on the Ministry of Education software has been updated so now young people um, can be enrolled as male, female, gender diverse, trans, female, or trans male, and that, that's going to save lives, having teachers using correct pronouns.